thanks everybody for who's joining us today. Um, as Amber said, my name is Jeff Lush, and I'm here to talk about just enough open source, a kickstart on security, license compliance, and dis business models. Um, this is going to be a two part session. So we're going to be going till about half past the hour for the first section, take about a 15 minute break, and then come back for the second half. Uh, hope you can join us for both pieces. A little bit about myself. My name is Jeff Lush. I have uh, been involved with open source since the 1990s. Uh, got my start doing scientific software, got involved with uh, kind of GCC licensing and library licensing way back in the 90s. And that got me involved with kind of all things open source. I started a company back in 2004 called Palomita. And it was one of the first companies to do basically scanning and management of open source software. Um, I've built compliance programs. I've worked with professional services teams to help implement those programs. And I've helped companies both small and large kind of manage their use of open source, manage their use of commercial software, do mergers and acquisitions, due diligence, all the things that uh, kind of put a, shine a light on people's use of open source and commercial code. I'm now working in a company called Peak Six, where I'm their director of open source, and really um, hope you can uh, uh, enjoy the talk today. Um, today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit in the first half around open source licenses. So what are they? What, are they, what do they mean? What's important about them? Uh, we'll talk about compliance, which means how do you use open source correctly and commercial code correctly. We'll then get into security and talk about the kind of security events that you might find in your open source as well as your commercial software. How do you fix them? What are their customer expectations? And a little bit about scanning and tooling. And then lastly, we'll get to best practices. So how do you work with suppliers? How do you can become compliant? Uh, educate the folks that are working at your company, remediation, which means fix, and some things about the future. Where's licensing going and what should we be paying attention to? So let's first talk about why we need open source licenses. Uh, I think we're all very familiar with commercial licensing. You know, if you have a phone, if you have a laptop, you almost certainly have gone out and bought a, bought a an app from the app store. You've paid your 99 cents, you've clicked I agree, continue, or you've installed some commercial software at work. And you understand that there's some document that says, if you do this, you can use the software. If you pay us money, you can, you can use the software. That's kind of the classic commercial licensing story. Well, open source is not commercial in the sense of uh, does not expect you to pay money to get, to get the library or to get the, the application but it still has obligations that you need to follow. And the main driver of this is that um, we, we use copyright law to kind of control access or allow access to people's apps or movies or sounds or books or pretty much anytime you put pen to paper or your fingers to the keyboard, you make something that is controlled by copyright. And the way the copyright law works in, in most countries is that you need explicit permission to use somebody else's work. And there are some exclusions for things like uh, fair use and whatnot, but for the most part for our day-to-day, -day, um, if we're working at a company, you, you probably should expect to get explicit permission to use somebody else's thing, whether it's an app or source code or an icon image or whatever. Um, and how we give permission is something called a license. We talked about commercial licensing. Open source is the same thing, but for open source projects. It's going to give you permission to use that resource as long as certain obligations are fulfilled. So if you're willing to do A, B, C, and D, the open source author says, great, you can use my, you can use my library, you can use my source code, whatever it is. Uh, we write up these licenses, these agreements, and in the commercial world, you find very often that the commercial licenses are one-offs. Every time you sign up for a different commercial product, you got a different license, you got to root your lawyers, look at it, you look at it and say, okay, this looks good to us. In the open source world, what we figured out a while ago is it, it's best to have some very common licenses that we don't have to read each single line of code each and every time to understand what the obligations are. And so we reuse these and we give them names. So you might know some famous open source licenses like the general public license or the BSD license. And the idea is if we reuse them, it makes it a lot easier. Um, we don't have this kind of friction about using a new library. Well, let's talk about some of the obligations. So when you use open source, there is a series of obligations that you may find that you need to follow. Um, there may be no, there may be no obligations whatsoever. The license might just say, do whatever you want with this. I don't care. Uh, 
Um, but in general, if you're using an open source library, there is a series of one or more obligations that might be as simple as just saying, I'm, I'm not going to sue you if I use this and something wrong happens. That's a disclaimer. Uh, there might be a requirement or an obligation to keep the copyright notices in the source code or to put them in something like you're in about box or your documentation. Um, also, you'll see that there may be a, an obligation to share source code. Uh, that's a concept called copyleft, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's kind of a pun on the word copyright. But the idea of copyleft is that there's an expectation or obligation to share either part of your source code or all of your source code under certain circumstances with your users or the people you distribute your product to. And while this last one is not a open source, it's by its very definition not an open source obligation, um, it's very often mentioned when we're talking about licensing around um, open source or software, which is now more and more these business model restrictions. The idea is if you use this code, uh, you may not be able to do A, B, C, and D. And again, that's not explicitly open source. It's, it's contrary to open source uh, model, but it often is uh, adjacent. And I, I think it's important to talk about things that are adjacent to open source licensing in these talks. And obviously some of these obligations are gonna be a lot easier to comply with than others. You know, an obligation to do nothing is a lot easier than an obligation to say, give away all your source code. I'm not gonna walk through all of the items here, but what you will find is that there are multiple obligations that may be present. There's some very, very common ones, and there's gonna be some more uncommon ones as well. So we, we've talked about like the obligation to pay money. That's a classic commercial obligation. Um, share source code, that's the copy left. Um, share credit, which means maybe preserve notices or give credit in about boxes. But there's other, other obligations that you may find as well, like around patents. So if you are at a company or a project that is dealing with patents, um, patent content, video, audio, um, software, you may find that there is um, an obligation to give uh, basically free access to your patents required to run that software or vice versa. If you sue someone around patents, there may be a retaliation clause, which means you lose access to that open source library if you sue other people. Um, these are fairly complicated and definitely involve uh, a lot of legal talent to understand. Um, I bring these up because it is, it is important to understand what you're allowed and not allowed to do in certain fields of use when you are um, using open source or commercial code as well. You may find similar obligations in the commercial libraries you're pulling in as well. Um, one thing you'll see is a term of art you might hear as a vanity license. Um, those are very often rare licenses. Um, they may be famous, but they may be rare, and they require some non-traditional action. Again, these may or may not be official open source licenses under the open source definition, but you'll, you'll find it as you, you, you download code and, and go through code reviews. And these may be things like the buy me a beer if this helps you license, the free beer license, or a do no evil license, or, or get vaccinated license. Um, these licenses, these vanity licenses are, are often good for a laugh, but sometimes cause some annoyance when you are um, trying to do a legal review or uh, get clearance for um, kind of sharing your software or using your software. Um, I, will, I will tell you that typically these, these licenses take more, more legal time to review than those common licenses that we, we talk about, um, uh, like the uh, general public license or the uh, MIT license, because the lawyers have never seen them before and they need to go through them line by line and understand what the impacts to your organization is. So I think it's important to go and look at the history of licensing because it helps us understand what the world is now. You know, if you study history, you can definitely understand why we are, do what we do now and also what the future may hold for us. So if we go back to the, the mid 1980s, that's really where the, the, the modern open source licensing world started. There's always been shared source. There's always been software that's been available. But our, I, would, I would say the modern open source licensing world started in the mid 80s where we had the X11, also known as the MIT license appear, the BSD license a couple of years later. And then on the other side of the house, kind of the, the GPL, the general public licenses. And um, what you'll find is the two philosophies of open source um, really got started then as well. Kind of the X11 MIT BSD philosophy of sharing, sharing credit and giving notice. You know, I'm using this software or preserve these copyright statements in the source versus the share your source code, uh, the copy left idea, like the general public license or the LGPL license. And what's amazing is we kind of got the licensing right back then. 
um, in the 80s and early 90s, we still used these licenses pretty much almost as written back then in our day to day. Uh, the dot com boom, uh, the kind of the internet appeared around the year 2000, plus or minus. And one of the things that's interesting there is we started to see um, a lot more kind of business interest in open source and a lot more kind of corporate attitudes around making sure that there's all the proper definitions and the legal agreements that they're signing. And you'll notice that the licenses got longer and started talking about things like patents and, and what's the definition of a contractor and, and all these things, but basically same idea, you know, very similar concepts about how to use and share source code um, appeared there. And now we're here in 2021 and the, the world is changing again. Uh, we're on the cusp of a new open source era. And, and if you look and, and, and kind of look back in time, you'll see that the licenses of each era kind of get defined by the, the, the universe that people were building software and sharing software back then. So in the, the 80s, it was really kind of about workstations and desktops. So uh, you know, the, the beginnings of the internet, but really that was around sharing files and not sharing services. And so very much about the 80s was here's, I want, I want access to the source code and I wanna be able to understand the permissions, but it was really about kind of uh, the, the beginnings of the open source world. In the 2000s where we really saw kind of the corporate interest and the Linux world appear, and we see the longer licenses and the kind of the beginnings of, of talking about how licensing in the cloud era might occur. Um, but now we're in what I, I call the cloud era, basically, we're starting to see less about distributing products, uh, say on a device or a, um, a download, and more about providing cloud services or website services or APIs. And we're seeing some new licenses that may not be open source, but are, are open source adjacent, like the Commons Clause and the server side public license. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. But I, I, I think what's kind of of interest here is that there is a new world of licensing um, appearing right now. And it's unclear where, where it's gonna end up, but I think it's important to understand what's, what's going on. And I have a couple slides later on about that. So let's talk about the style of licensing. Um, as I mentioned before, there, there, there seems to be two main philosophies in the open source world. Uh, uh, and you will see that there is a million terms for these. And, and sometimes people will get caught up about, oh, it's this, it's not that, or I can't believe you called it this instead of that. Um, I think it's important to respect the communities and understand the communities, but also sometimes clarity about talking about these things is helpful as well. So the first, the first type of open source that we see is what some people call uh, permissive. Um, sometimes people call those attribution or notice licenses or academic licenses. There's a lot of names for these, but the general idea is they require preserving or supplying the copyright notices and or the license text if you use or distribute these products. Uh, some good examples are like the BSD license, the MIT license, the Apache license. And they may have different levels of sharing of that credit that you need to pass on. The other side of the coin is the copyleft style, sometimes called reciprocal or viral licenses. And the idea here is that you need to, su you need to supply all or some of the source code of your program under certain conditions. And we'll talk about what those conditions are in a little bit. Um, so let's talk about the permissive licenses. So the kind of the classics that are here are the Apache licenses, the BSD licenses, and the MIT licenses. And there's, there's many other licenses um, that have these requirements. And, and um, even the copyleft licenses will have some of these notice requirements and license requirements. But the heart of it, the Apache, BSD, and MIT licenses, really what their, their, their goal is, is to give credit where credit's due. Um, make sure that if you're distributing a product based on these, uh, preserve the copyright text, and in many cases, pass along the license text to your users. And that's what we call the notices. So when you're doing open source compliance, and you're talking about, uh, are you in compliant with these licenses? Very often people are gonna say, Do you, have you produced the notices file or the notices or the libraries that you're using? Um, and these may appear in a couple of different places. These may be in your about box. So if you have a, uh, a mobile phone, uh, you can go and go to your uh, kind of general settings, legal settings and see page after page of license text. Um, if you are on your desktop and you go to the about box in many of the desktop apps you're, you're using, you'll, again, you'll find sometimes it will say open source notices or legal notices. 
And again, pages and pages of, of open source license text will appear there. Um, classic, um, classic case is putting things in the open about box um, or legal info. Um, many of the licenses also may say, please put this in your documentation. So you may open up the big PDF and see at the end of the PDF of the, the user manual, there may be the open source notices. And again, page after page of license text uh, kind of positioned or, or dumped there. And then obviously in the um, source code world, um, it's important to preserve the license text that's in the code that you received. It's actually a very big no-no if you are stripping out license text or removing license files from the code that you receive. So on the other side, we talked about the copyleft or the viral licenses or typical licenses. There, there's kind of three main licenses that you'll see there. Um, the LGPL, the Lesser General Public License, the General Public License, and the Afero General Public License. Um, these are kind of a spectrum. Uh, you'll see that they'll be defined very often as a weak copyleft, strong copyleft, and a network copyleft. And the idea there is that for the weak copyleft, uh, you need to give away some of the source code, typically the source code that's inside the library that you, you kind of downloaded and brought in. Um, the strong copyleft idea is to preserve, uh, to, to pass along the source code for the entire application that's linked. And then the, the network copyleft is for the new world of kind of cloud services, where if you build a product and you're depending on say a GPL license code, there are certain circumstances where you may be um, obligated to pass along the source code for your web, your, your web app um, through the network. And we'll talk a little bit about the specifics there. So when you talk about open source licensing, very often there's a discussion around linking, uh, especially if you're building something like an IoT device or a desktop app or a, a Linux app, the question of linking comes up. And the reason why this is so important is because some of the open source licenses um, come into effect based on how you combine the libraries or the source code together. That's called linking. Uh, the idea in the computer science world is you bring in a library and, sorry, you bring in a library and you see how, I'm sorry, there's a question about closed captioning here. Um, the idea with linking is you bring in a library and you combine it with code that you write and you, you um, combine it with code that other people have written. The various libraries you've downloaded, the various source code you've written, you've mixed it all together into your application you link it all together and that's what makes your final app. And the LGPL, the Lesser General Public License came out in a time where people said, you know, from a free software open source perspective, hey, let's make sure that our libraries are super high quality. And if people are making improvements to those libraries, we want those improvements to be shared with the community and the world. And so the licensing there is let's, let's not worry about what's in the app that you're writing, but if you do make any improvements to the library that you're pulling in or the under the LGPL license, you give it back to the community. If you, if you are distributing your app out there, you know, putting it on app store, allowing it for download or giving it to customers. And this is the concept of weak copy left is um, improve the library components that you bring in that are under weak copy left licenses. And, uh, there are some specifics. If you link it this way or you link it that way, there are definitely some specifics where um, the licensing might get more complicated. And this is where you bring in your open source uh, lawyers. And I am not a lawyer, so don't take this as legal advice. But the general idea is understand your linking and understand the licensing that you're using so that you can respect the community and not have to fix things um, after the fact. The general public license, on the other hand, says uh, comes from the idea of all source code should be shared. And if you're building an application and you pulled in a library or a chunk of source code under a, a viral or a copyleft license, the idea is you found the software useful. We think the whole universe should find your software useful and your users should have the ability to examine your source code. And so the code for both what you wrote and the code that you brought in from the open source world should be available and shared. And that's the idea of strong copyleft. And this typically comes into effect if you are distributing your app. So like if your app is going on an app store or you're, you're delivering it to your customers, um, the, the concept of copyleft is going to be likely in effect for your, for your app. Um, if you're not distributing it, say you're, if you're putting it out there as a website, you may not find yourself having to um, have any 
GPL, for example, compliance requirements. But if you change your business model, if you start distributing that app to somebody, you may suddenly find yourself with a GPL problem for yourself. Um, so it's really important to understand how your application is being distributed and also what your future plans for that app may be. So again, understanding how it's linked, understanding what the licensing is coming in and understanding your business model is very important. And then lastly, in the copyleft world, there's the Afero general public license. This was a license that came out kind of in the, in, the, in the 2000s. And the idea is, hey, we know we're living in a cloud world. We know that the idea of shipping software, distributing software around is changing. Um, yes, you have apps. Yes, you may be downloading uh, enterprise software, but so much of the software that people are using day after day after day is, is access to the website. And that is not traditionally seen as a distribution of that like the LGPL or the GPL licenses cared about. And so the, the open source community made a new license to, to address this use case. Um, and this is what's called a not network copyleft license. And there are some legal complexities there. And I think some of the licensing is still a little unclear for folks. So in general, if you are if you're in the cloud world and you find yourself using a GPL licensed software, I think that is a perfect time to bring your, your, your legal counsel in to understand how you're using it and how that software may affect um, your use, you're just you're basically the, the, the compliance of your product. You'll sometimes hear people call the ASP loophole to the GPL as a, as a thing to discuss. And the idea there was that since um, the GPL does not typically come into effect if you're just providing something through a website, uh, a lot of the folks in the open source community said, hey, we, we, we want open source to have licensing that is um, you know, visible and aware of this new cloud world. And that's where the AGPL came in. I will say the AGPL has not been a very popular license compared to say GPL or other licenses, but when you do see it, it's very important to, to, to understand what's going on. Um, the copyleft licenses that you may see day to day, the AGPL, the GPL, the LGPL, uh, another one, Sleepy Cat, which is a license of, uh, associated with a, a very popular open source library, um, uh, database called the Sleepy Cat uh, database or Berkeley DB database. Um, and also one that you will probably see almost every day, but not even realize it is a, is a license called the Creative Commons Share Alike, CCSA. Um, this is a license that's associated with the Stack Overflow uh, forums where people share code samples. And it's a little bit of a compliance problem for, for companies because the code samples are licensed under this, what's seen as a copyleft license. But the first thing people do is they take that code and they cut and paste it into their apps um, that shouldn't have copyleft code in it. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's a very common headache for folks, which is there's this kind of strong copyleft license that um, people do not are unaware of that it's a copyleft license and then find themselves later on trying to rip it out or um, relicense that code. Some of the other weak copyleft licenses like the LGPL or the Eclipse public license, very common to see, especially in certain communities like the Java community um, for some of the uh, uh, libraries that are there. Um, again, th those are about sharing the fixes to the libraries themselves as opposed to the, the entire application that you build for the weak copyleft. So let's talk a little bit more about copyleft. Uh, the idea here is that you're supposed to be sharing source code. Um, and so some source code may need to be shared or all of your source code may, may be, need to be shared. And I think it's important from a compliance perspective, if you are using any copyleft style libraries, it's important to record that source code someplace, you know, typically inside a Git or one of your, your, your code, uh, uh, your code, code storage mechanism, because it's really hard after the fact to go to try to find the exact source code that you need to comply with. So in the future, somebody might come to you and say, I love your app, thanks so much for it. And I would like the uh, code for the copyleft libraries that this app depends on. And for many of these licenses, you have that obligation to give a source bundle. I mean, you know, zip file or tarball are, are common um, uh, words for that archive that you basically would pass on to the people asking for that. And, it's hard after the fact. It's it's like kind of somebody saying, hey, can you find this document from 1997 way after the fact? The best time to record this is when your developers actually go out and download that library. 
they might be downloading like the compiled version of it, uh, like through a jar file or a DLL. But the best time to store that copy left code away is that, that exact moment. So it's a good policy to have for your developers is for, to have them also download the source code and store that away. So your compliance in the future will be a lot easier. And I think that's important, even if you don't find yourself under current copy left obligations, it is websites disappear all the time. And even with great services like the Internet Archive, um, you should be in control of the code that you depend on. And it's important to have it in your systems, because if you can't find it in the future, the onus is still on you to be able to provide it. Um, another term that might you will hear is corresponding source. And kind of the general idea is it's the source code, but it may also include things like the build scripts, the make files, et cetera, above and beyond the source code itself. Again, these can get into the specifics of, of the compliance, but it's good to understand these terms and um, start making your plans, especially if you're in a, 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 somebody making like IoT software, or automotive software, or software for an app store. Anytime that you have a classic distribution, um, it's important to record these, this information. So you talked, I talked a little bit before that we're in this cloud era, this kind of post cloud era. And the idea there is there is a lot of money being made out there by companies. There are companies who started out as open source and are finding themselves worth billions of dollars. And there's also, they're looking around, they also see other companies making a lot of money, um, perhaps off of their, their own open source projects. And so there's been a lot of heat and light and discussions and arguments and fights about um, what does it mean to be an open source based company in the 2020s? And do you need to let everybody um, have the same access to your code? Uh, under the official open source definition, uh, you can't restrict who can use your code and how they use it. But you'll see more and more folks saying, well, we're open source, but dot, dot, dot. We're actually going to kind of be what's called source available. Um, so maybe not officially under open source license anymore or some parts of their projects under open source, but not the whole thing. And the licensing that we're, we're seeing appear here is not open source. It's what I might call cons consider commercial licensing, but uh, it's, let's say it's open source adjacent. So things like the commons clause or the server side public license. And what these are doing is putting restrictions on certain business cases and competitive business cases, particularly in terms of um, hosting services and reselling services around these libraries and these, these, uh, these systems. So if you're dealing with things like databases, um, monitoring and search, these are some, some company areas that we're starting to see this change from classic commercial licensing or classic open source licensing to these uh, kind of business model restrictions. Um, so it's important to know this, they're not open source, but they're, they're, they're open source adjacent and they sometimes gets a little gray in terms of um, what's it mean, what do these licenses mean, et cetera. But the general idea is pay attention to um, the, the seismic shifts that are occurring um, in your, in your especially in your vendors around databases, search and uh, monitoring. So let's, let's put our hat on and say, Let's go look at an, a common license. Let's, let's understand a little bit about the licensing. This may be something that comes across your desk. Uh, your engineers are going to come to you, or you're going to you're going to be downloading something, and you're going to try to understand what the heck am I looking at? What does an open source license look like? What does it mean? Um, so I've picked one of the shorter licenses here. Very common license called the BSD license, and what I like about this is it hits a lot of the elements of licensing um, in a pretty small package. So. Um, this is a pretty typical structure for a license. It may be a page like this, it might be 30 pages, but the general idea is there's going to be um, information about who wrote this, what are the terms of the obligations, and then maybe some legalese. So let's, let's look through this line by line. Um, I've, uh, I've put arrows next to the various blocks here and given uh, kind of a description of what we're looking at. There are some colors, but if you're having problems with the colors, um, they should match up uh, one by one by one here. And the general idea is most licenses are going to have a copyright statement. Typically that is the copyright owner, the person who wrote the code is gonna be mentioned there. Though sometimes I'll find that um, that gets a little confusing. Is it, is it about the copyright owner of the license itself or is it of the code? Um, it is important to understand who actually wrote the code. Um, and so look for that copyright statement. Very often those copyright statements are what's expected to be seen in your about box if you're not uh, above and beyond the licensing. Um, 
you're going to want to see what the permissions around re redistribution and use is. So can I can I use it in source form and binary form? Is there going to be something that says if I use this in binary form that I need to provide the source code to my users? Uh, that's a copyleft term that's very important to, to watch out for. Um, you're going to see the retain the copyright notice in the source code form. That's what's in yellow here in section one. Um, section two says, yeah, and retain the copyright notice and put the license in binary files as well. Um, number three is a non-endorsement clause, meaning don't don't use our name. You know, don't don't say good things about us or don't say that you're good because you use us. And then lastly, that disclaimer, very common to see in all caps there, that basically says, uh, you know, don't don't come after us uh, and sue us if this thing doesn't work for you. So this is a classic license BSD. You're going to see all the other licenses have very similar. Uh, forms to this. They may have more definitions, they may um, have more obligations, but the general format is going to be very similar. So let's talk a little bit about the patents. Um, if you are dealing with audio, video, uh, streaming things across the internet, if you're dealing with certain um, maybe compression schemes and things like that, you may find that there are patents that your company is either trying to enforce and, and create or that you may find you may need to license. So the code may be free to you, but the, the technology, the patented technology behind the scenes may require some licensing, um, some, some financial licensing to be paid. And so um, keep an eye out for that, especially any anytime audio or video is being used. I'm always very mindful that is there an additional um, payment required for the, for the use of that technology? Um, that's a, a patent license that may need to be paid. Um, other, other licenses are going to talk about um, passing along certain patents uh, permissions for free if you're, if you're producing code or using code under this license. So if you're a company that has a lot of patents um, or working in spaces where there's a lot in patents, this is a very important place to watch out for, um, especially if your company is thinking about doing any sort of patent lawsuits in the future. You may find yourself with um, losing access to some of the open source that you're depending on um, if you do that. So um, important, important discussion with your lawyers um, if you are involved with any of that. So let's talk about dual licensing. This is a very confusing topic for people because the question is always, what does it mean? Why do I see multiple license names um, next to the name of a library? Does that mean that they're both in effect? Does that mean I have a choice? And you know, the answer in open source is always, it depends. But usually if a, if a library is calling itself dual licensed or there's dual licensing available, it usually means you have a choice in the licensing to you as a, as a user of that library. And it's, there's a couple different purposes why you will see dual licensing. Um, the first one is what I call a business model forcing function. Well, you'll have like a, what, you know, a scary license and a friendly license. Um, so they might have a scary license, you know, this, uh, like a, a very strong copyleft license where you as a business might say, oh, we can't use that. We can't use copyleft in our, in our project, but oh, this is a great library, it's a great component. If only there was another license available, and then guess, guess what? There's a commercial license that, that the company will gladly sell you um, if you're unwilling or unable to use it under that scary license or a scary to you license. Um, you see this very often in open core or um, kind of uh, open source companies where they'll have a, a, a strong license for their, their typical library that you can download. You'll see this very often in the database companies. Oh, you can download it for free and use it. But if you start using it for commercial purposes or doing distributions, you may find that the licensing terms, open source licensing terms are, are not good for your, your business model. And you'll find yourself um, kind of buying your way out of that open source license by buying the commercial license. That's the, that's the most common reason we'll see dual licensing these days in 2021. In some of the older code you'll see, it was really a sign to say, yes, we, we, we're, we're compatible with all of these different um, open source models or ecosystems. So you'll see this like jQuery, what older versions of jQuery would say, oh, I'm, I'm licensed under this or that, or these tri license, MPL or GPL or LGPL. Um, you could use it under any of those licenses. And really it was about uh, showing that the community um, shouldn't have any worry about using it in the open source projects themselves. Um, don't see that very often anymore. Usually it's the forcing function. Okay. Um, in terms of dual licensing examples, um, the, the general places you'll see this 
I think most times it's going to be um, databases. So MySQL, MongoDB, you'll see the options of an open source license or a commercial license there. Or some things like iText, which is a PDF library, um, a GPL li license or commercial, or Wolf LSSL will be GPL or commercial. Very common to see those, and almost certainly you're using one of these libraries or these projects in your company right now. Um, the older versions of jQuery were GPL or MIT. They've now just changed their license to MIT. If you, if you happen to see a version of jQuery that's GPL or MIT in your code base, that's a sign perhaps you need to be upgrading your version of jQuery because maybe it's a little too old. So let's talk about um, license versions. So as time goes on, open source license versions change. So you may see like the general public license went from version one back in the, the 1980s to version two to now version three. Um, Apache software license version one to 1.1 to 2.0. Um, some have version numbers like that. Others have um, descriptions like BSD won't have a version, but they'll say zero clause, one clause, two clause, three clause. Um, and the idea there is to try to give you of understanding of which version of the license are we talking about. The difference between Apache 1 and Apache 2.0 is pretty great when you look at the license text itself. You know, the, the, the version 1 license is very short, the version 2 license is fairly long. From a, from a use case perspective, they're pretty similar, but the version 2 license definitely gives more legalese and more descriptions and more definitions to make it easier for business, businesses to understand what's allowed and what's not allowed with it. Um, the BSD license started out with like a four, four clauses. And as time has gone on, people have removed more and more obligations from the BSD license for certain use, use cases. And then there's things to watch out for, like MIT license has no version, no clause difference. But if you go out there, there might be 23 different variants of the MIT license out there, depending on which one you grab. So if you go to Fedora Project and look at that, they have they found 23 different um, versions of the MIT license in the code that they're using, all slightly different. And, it, and you know, when it comes to legal compliance, it's important to understand exactly what you're signing up for. So, so what does it mean? What, what, what does it mean uh, you know, reviewing the licenses? Why do I need to care? Um, distribution for many organizations is where um, a lot of the open source license discussions come into effect. And the idea behind open source licensing uh, for the most part was based on the world where products were being distributed, whether it was a install installer that went out, whether it was an app that went out, whether it was a device, um, a container, whatever it is, it's something that went from the company's uh, location to your business or personal location, got installed on your device, your laptop, whatever it may be, something that you purchased or downloaded. Um, so. If you are in the, one of those worlds, building apps, containers, devices, cars, IoT devices, et cetera, it's extremely important for you to understand distribution, linking, et cetera. If you're building websites uh, or, or SaaS apps, software as a service apps, you may have less concerns about some of these licenses because of the distribution. You're not distributing a product based on those. Um, so it is important to ask, and you may find that you have multiple use cases for the same product. You may have software as a service running out there on some cloud service, but you also are providing a, uh, an app on a mobile phone. Um, there may be cases where libraries are be being distributed on the phone that you didn't realize. Um, very often people say, oh, we're, we're, we're private cloud. We, don't, we never distribute anything. And then their largest customer in the world says, oh, except for us, we want you to bring it over to us and, and install it on our, our systems. So you might have gone from not having a distribution to distributing your entire software stack. And so if you are moving from a, a non-distribution to a distribution world, it's very common for you to have a lot of open source compliance problems. Because if you built under one regime and now you're running under a different regime, licensing regime, um, you may find that the, the compliance use case was completely night and day. So understand what you're building, understand what your future business model changes may be, especially if you're going from uh, software as a service to maybe a distribution model in the future. Um, you may find yourself needing to do some fixes or remediation. Okay, so a couple things. What looks like open source but isn't? Uh, so um, we often talk about open source but in general, when you are finding yourself in the kind of the management world of managing your third-party software, you're going to see commercial code, you're going to see true open source, 
then you're going to find stuff that people just downloaded and they thought it's open source. They might call it open source, but it's not. Um, and there's a spectrum of things there. There may be code marked for non-commercial use, also known as NC. Um, in general, if I see that in my place where I'm working, I try to fix that because uh, uh, most most of what most of the things that we're doing, we probably are going to consider commercial use. You know, if you're doing something as a hobby or at home, maybe that's non-commercial. But if I see that at a workplace, um, that's something I, I need to fix. Um, I might see freeware or things with click-through EULAs or these weird one-off licenses. We're not sure if it's commercial or open source or whatnot. These may be cases where we want to record the license and talk to our legal staff or our engineering staff about, are we okay with this? What are we signing up for? Nobody might have reviewed those licenses. You might simply just say all rights reserve. Well, that doesn't give any obligations or that doesn't give you any permissions or it doesn't give you an insight into the obligations you're signing up for. And same thing with code with no declared license. You might go out to GitHub and you can download it, but if you don't have a license file, um, you really don't have any permission to use that. So these are all things to be aware of. And when you build your bill of materials, kind of your list of open source that you're, 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 you're using, it's important for you to um, understand this, the licensing, is it open source? Is it, is it the, the, the stuff in the middle or commercial? And keep track of this. Sometimes people just say, oh, just keep track of your open source. My philosophy is to keep track of anything third party that your company didn't write. So um, we have, I think, a couple minutes here before our break. Um, so how about I stop and see if there's any questions here. And if there are, we'll take those now. And then I believe we're going to have a 15-minute um, a break and come back at 345 to um, go over uh, security, best practices, and other elements of compliance. So any questions? You know, to Q and A here. Um, I have a, a, a question here. As it said, if it's too hard to decide on a license, is it best or not to have a declared license? Um, so let me let me answer. Let me try to take a stab on that. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, uh, this you know, kind of the the declared license or not. But in general. Um, if you are making something that you want to be open source, you want to put it out there on the internet, and you want other people to use it, it's it's imperative for you to declare a license. Um, so if you go to GitHub and you make a new um, repository, for example, it's gonna it's gonna pass you over to a site called I think chooseaLicense.org or .com, and it's gonna walk you through some some possibilities. It's not an exhaustive list. There's many many licenses that are out there you can choose. They're gonna kind of put you into a, a small subset, but I think it's important for you to understand what is your what is your uh, you know let's call them your clientele. What how do you want people to use your licenses? You might pick something like a Apache 2.0 license if um, you don't expect people to share the source code, but you want people to understand what what the um, that it is open source and that there are certain um, maybe notice requirements or obligations for them, but you don't care about sharing the source. Um, you may might pick to say GPL if you expect people to um, um, share all the source code, or if you've picked a base that is um, requires you to be, say, something under the GPL license, et cetera. So um, I think, long story short, if you're putting out something out there for some other people to use, you do have to pick a license, in my opinion. And um, you can always change that license in the future, but it's important to get the license right for your community, for the community you want to build. And it's also important for your license to be compatible with the, the other libraries that you brought in. So if you bring in something that's GPL, you probably will find yourself in a world uh, that the, your, your code itself probably should be GPL and, and pass that through and so on and so on. So um, thanks for that question there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second half as well in terms of compliance and, uh, and obligations there. So thanks so much. So it's, it's half past right now. Um, we will take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back here and we'll continue on with the uh, rest of the session here and we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. So thank you very much. Well, everybody, thanks so much for, for rejoining us. Uh, I'm gonna continue with the second half of the Just Enough Open Source, a kickstart on security, license compliance and business models. If, if you're just joining us right now, I think you'll uh, be able to get a lot out of the second half of this even without the first half. I'm gonna be talking about security and compliance. Um, as before, please uh, feel free to ask some questions, put them in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will spend a couple minutes at the end of the talk uh, going through that as well. If you have any um, 
other comments, you know, please send me uh, something either through Twitter at Jeff Lush or um, through my blog at zebracatzebra.com. A little easier to spell than, uh, than Lush. Okay, uh, a little bit about me. I've been doing open source since uh, the 90s and um, had a lot of experience working with compliance and um, companies getting them up to speed around open source. And I'm now the director of open source at Peak6. So if you have any questions, um, about any of the, this history, also feel free to um, ask in the QA, Q&A, or through email afterward. So what we're going to uh, finish up today is the rest of security and best practices, and um, as well as some of the business model discussions and hot topics. So you might have uh, remembered from just about 15 minutes ago, we were talking about things that looked like open source that were not. Um, I always like talking about public domain as well. Um, what very often you will hear the term public domain misused. It is a series of magic words. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so don't take this as legal advice. Um, but I hear these words come up in all the time around open source and open source licensing and description and on the internet. And it has a very specific legal meaning. That meaning itself may be different depending on which country or part of the world you're in. But whenever I hear people say public domain, my, my ears kind of uh, perk up. And I, I want to make sure that uh, you know what, whatever I'm reading or what I'm listening to is accurate when it talks about the public domain. So these words are very often misused. So sometimes developers will say, "Oh yeah, it's 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 public domain source code," and what they really mean is it's GPL, um, or this code is public domain when they really mean that it's open source. So. Uh, it's usually not enough just to hear that somebody said, "Oh, it's public domain." I'm pretty sure. You you want to you want to be sure. You know, it's it's important to look at the original code, make sure they know what they're talking about. I I've seen people, the developers themselves in the open source world, say this code is licensed to the public domain under the GPL license. Like those are words I've explicitly seen, and that's like a nonsense statement. Like they the the two halves of that statement are not compatible with each other. So understand what 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 public domain world you're actually living in and um, you may want to look or look at project licenses like the creative commons zero license also known as the cc zero license which is um, a open source license that was designed to give uh, kind of the the equivalent or tries to be the equivalent of the public domain with really kind of a worldwide reach there's there's many countries that don't um, have the concept of a public domain, or um, it's hard to give away your rights. So you may want to look at something like Creative Commons Zero as something that makes it really clear what the obligations and the expectations are from a kind of a worldwide reach. So when don't we know enough? Um, when you're looking at your list of open source libraries, that's something we call a bill of materials, or you're looking at a web page and you're trying to understand what the heck is this? There's sometimes statements from the developers or statements from your co colleagues that that's that are um, informative but not complete so somebody might say oh it's licensed under a creative commons license um, it's important to understand that creative commons is an organization that has a whole spectrum of licenses um, from everything like we just talked about the cc0 being almost like the public domain all the way over to something like the uh, creative commons share alike which is a very strong copyleft license. So that there's a whole spectrum there from pretty much no obligations to sharing your source code obligations. So you need to know more. If something is CC licensed, you need to know kind of the extra letters, the extra words um, that, that fully define that license. Where somebody says, oh, I got it on, it codes on GitHub. Well, that's not sufficient. Yeah, yeah it's out there. I mean, you can download it, the source is available, but you might have absolutely no per permissions to use that in a, in a kind of a business environment or an open source environment. Or sometimes like, oh, I got the code from our supplier. It's part of a SDK, a software development kit. Um, just because you got it from your supplier doesn't mean that it's commercial. I see a lot of companies get themselves in trouble because they they trust that everything that came on the DVD or everything that came from the download is commercial and they can do whatever they want with it. And when you open it up, it's full of Linux code or code under general public license or, or other open source licenses. So just because your supplier gave it to you uh, doesn't mean that it's a commercially licensed code. You might have paid a lot of money for it, but there may be other obligations and other licenses there. Or somebody says, oh, we bought a license for this. Um, great, C classic commercial licensing. Was it, was it per year? Was it just for a certain 
use case? Was it just for a certain um, uh, person? So it's important to understand all the licensing from open source to uh, commercial licensing. The other thing that has changed is just the sheer amount of open source and third-party code that are that's in a typical product these days. Um, if you go back in time to like the year 2000 at the bottom of this pyramid here, you might have had 50 libraries, 50 open source projects in your classic LAMP stack. If you remember the LAMP, you know, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. 50 libraries was a huge open source uh, dependency tree back in the year 2000. Oh my gosh, I can't believe how long it figured out, it took us out to figure that out and understand the licensing and all that. That was the year 2000. Um, 2010, a pretty typical application would have about 500 components. That's a lot to manage. That's a lot to discover, um, kind of in the cloud world, beginning of the cloud world. And now, when you see like these um, node apps uh, with all microservices and you know the, they call it the mean stack, um, you might have 5,000 libraries. They might be very tiny libraries, little pieces here and there. But you got 5,000 of things. You know, 5,000 of anything is an extremely diff difficult thing to manage. If it was 5,000 nuts and bolts and screws, um, that's a non-trivial thing to keep them all in, in you know, track of, is let alone 5,000 software components. So how do you get all this code? How did we go from 50 libraries to now like 500 or 5,000? Well, one of the things is your developers are probably using a repository manager. That's basically a special software package that goes out and downloads from the internet open source dependencies. So you might hear terms like Maven or Nexus or Artifactory or NPM or PIP or PyPy. These are all um, services for managing open source dependencies and sometimes commercial dependencies. And they, they download things from the internet, they cache them, they sometimes have some light policy management there. Um, that's often the thing that's gonna bring in dozens to hundreds of libraries. You might specify, oh, I need this library. And the package manager, the repository manager will also bring in all of its dependencies, um, sometimes surprising dependencies. Um, your developers might go to the, download it directly from the web. They might use a magic shell script. They might cut and paste source code or get things from things called paste bins or gists where, where you can cut little pieces of code there sometimes without licensing clear. Um, maybe your content delivery network is passing along, especially for JavaScript libraries. Um, you might be getting it from your commercial um, projects or bundled with other open source packages. It may be your infrastructure, like your databases, your operating systems, and vendors and suppliers. These are all the ways that open source and other third-party software gets into your company or gets into your product. And very often, people just look at one of these. Like They just might stop at the first line of, oh, we'll manage it, manage everything coming from the repository managers and ignore everything else. And I, and I think that's a mistake. You do have to start someplace and you, you can't boil the ocean and solve everything, but your policy around your company and your kind of complete vision of where your third-party dependencies come from, whether it's commercial open source, kind of is from this entire list of items. So just because you manage your repositories doesn't mean you've, you've solved your problem and you should keep, you know, keep working on it. And the idea here is what we call the software supply chain. And I think this is the year of the software supply chain. You know, you're going to read a lot about and hear a lot about like the solar winds attack and how the software supply chain is, is, is uh, you know, weak and damaged. Um, over the weekend, you know, PHP, the, 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 so, uh, the, the kind of the software library and, and runtime got hacked through a supply chain attack. Somebody, somebody injected a backdoor directly into the source code and it got caught, thankfully. Um, this is the year, I think, of every year of, of people talking about the supply chain. What are you using? How did you get it? How is it managed? Typically, you have hundreds of suppliers. And if you're building something like an IoT or an automotive product, you probably have thousands of suppliers. And it's going to be a mixture of open source commercial and things you know, with free, with air quotes around them. Um, and it's not just libraries. It's software libraries, also known as components, tool chains like compilers and linkers documentation, code generators. And you may not have any access at all with your, with your suppliers. You might be just be given a big chunk of code and you don't even know where it came from. You may not even know where, how you got it, especially in the hardware world. This is very common. Um, so it's good to start understanding what your supply chain looks like, how code comes in, uh, record who gave it to you, what your permissions are, 
and just understand, you know, how far back does it go? Because um, you are the person responsible for the security and licensing of whatever you use, even if even if you got it from somebody else. And so one of the ways you manage that is through license policies. And so license policies help your developers, help your team, help your company understand what is the appropriate um, style of open source to use, what is, what is important around commercial code licensing, et cetera. So you define your policy. It's typically based on a distribution model. So these licenses are good for internal use. These licenses are good for um, our iPhone apps or our Android apps or our um, code that we're pushing out to customer uh, desktops, or this, this is allowed in the, um, in the car, but only in this level, the operating system level, but not the end user app level and so on and so on. So your distribution model and layers in your distribution model are gonna have different policies. And it's really important to have a clear policy. So your developers should be able to go to a centralized location or have a centralized document for like a live, always updated version of this. And it needs to be updated periodically. You're going to find new licenses almost every week. And you're going to say, we like it, we don't like it, or you come to us for more information because um, um, the specifics of how that code is used and how it's distributed um, is probably going to change based on uh, where you are in your company and how you distribute your code. And it's very expensive to rip out unacceptable code at a later point. So if you built a whole product, you put it in an IoT device, or you put it on the phone, or you put it in a car, and it turns out that the base of your, your whole stack is um, something that you can't use, um, it's going to be very expensive to rip out. Um, we saw this recently with um, Ruby on Rails um, last week or the week before. It turns out that they had a um, subcomponent that had a uh, what appeared to be a license difficulty or license problem where uh, had a code that may not have been appropriate to have inside of Rails. And they needed to basically delete that code, work around the license problem, build a new subcomponent and release a new version. And then it took a couple of days and it took a lot of attention by um, pretty much everybody who's involved with the, the Rails project there. Um, so understand what's there, how it got there, have a good plan. You are gonna find things that um, uh, may not be appropriate or are problems later on. Um, the Rails project was well served by their automation. They found that the component had a, um, disappeared and then they found that the license was not appropriate for them. And their automated systems really made it easy for them to understand where the problem was and what the type of problem was so they could get the right people to fix it. So let's talk about what compliance looks like. Um, if you are building a product for distribution, uh, you're gonna almost certainly need to have compliance notices. So you need to show uh, what open source you're using and pass along the appropriate things that the open source projects want you to pass along. Um, good example of this is if you're using something like Google Chrome and you go to the about box, um, it's very common for, for apps that you download to have something like this. You know, Google Chrome is made possible by the Chromium open source project and other open source software. And a nice blue link, you click it. And if you um, click on that, you are brought to a list of from, you know, Absel to Zlib. Uh, a to Z of all the open source libraries that Chromium depends on. And what you see is a nice list of the library name, a license, and a link to the homepage. And this may be above and beyond what the licenses require, especially for each item that, that's in this list, but it's very nice and I think it's very respectful of the open source world. It's showing the dependency on open source, it's showing the name, the actual license text itself, and kind of giving some publicity to the project by making it super easy to go to the homepage. And I think this is, like I said, very respectful of the open source world. And I, I always like pointing this as something to, if you can, um, I think it's something good to emulate um, in terms of um, you know, giving credit where credit's due. Um, and if you click on the, the show license, like I clicked here for the Zlib, it brings me to the actual licensed text for the library that Chromium depended on, a library called Zlib, which is a compression library. And we see the license text here, we see the version number, we see the copyright string, and um, you know some of the information that's there. Um, very nice to see, and it's, it's, it's the license management side can sometimes be kind of painful, like understanding where the license text came from, recording it, and having the accurate um, up-to-date version um, very often requires a tool to help manage. So the other reason why you want to have a list of your open source, you know, number one, we just showed it's you require for compliance needs. Very often you need to show the license text for the products that you're distributing. 
But even if you're not distributing something, like say you're a classic software service project and you say, oh, we don't have to worry about license notices. You wanna know what you're using because of vulnerabilities. Um, basically all source code, with all, all apps, whether it's commercial, whether open source, whatever, has bugs. Um, open source probably is, is safer or cleaner than many commercial projects because of the many eyes effect, et cetera. Uh, lots of people looking at it. But the general idea is, you know, people find attacks, people find ways to break into systems or, or get information out of it. And so one thing, one term that you're going to want to be aware of is a CVE. Um, that's kind of an industry name, uh, standard name for um, a defect list. So you can go to this database of defects out there at cve.mitre.org. And this is a clearinghouse of open source and commercial vulnerabilities. Each defect is given a number, like a serial number or a name. So like CVE-2021-0001 would be the first defect reported in the year 2021. And many, many defects get this level of analysis, you know, get this. So um, especially infrastructure pieces and very, very popular libraries and applications, but not all of them do. Um, just, you know, just because there's no defect listed for something in, in the uh, vulnerability database, the NVD, um, there still may be vulnerability. So you might see it in the projects defect tracker on GitHub or Bitbucket, or it may be only in an email list and things like that. But I would say, at a very minimum, you should be aware of the, the vulnerabilities that are popping up on the, um, the CVEs that are popping up in the National Vulnerability Database. Um, you're almost certainly aware of some, even if you didn't think you did, um, there's two vulnerabilities that really got uh, kind of worldwide visibility. So back in, um, you know, back in 2000, uh, 2014, there was the Heartbleed vulnerability around OpenSSL, which is an encryption library. Uh, basically affected every piece of modern infrastructure, network infrastructure, IoT device in the world. Um, what's crazy is I still find broken versions of OpenSSL from this era um, to this date. And it's just because people don't know what they're using and they don't have control over their software supply chain. Um, back in 2017, the Struts2 library had a vulnerability that was found and fixed. But um, that was one of the, the causes of the Equifax breach, if you remember that back in 2017 or so. And again, this is the importance of having understanding what you're using, what's coming in from your vendors, and have a plan for fixing it. Um, you need to know that it's there, you need to know that there's a vulnerability, and you need to have a way of getting your fix, whether it's a code change or a firewall rule or whatever your mitigation is, um, done very quickly. Because very often, you don't have a lot of time to, to fix these things. Um, one of the reasons why is because these attacks are scripted. You can download a, an attack kit and not even know what you're doing basically, just hit a button and go scan and find projects and vulner uh, vulnerable um, commercial projects that are out there, websites, et cetera, that are able to be hacked. So it's very easy for attackers or hackers to, to, under, to find places where um, these, you know, you could be attacked. Um, somebody once said in our industry, you know, open source components or all components age like milk, not like wine. So just because something's old, um, typically, the older a component is, the more likely I want to look for an upgrade because vulnerabilities may have been, whether it's public or not public, may have been found over time. And typically, the, the simple fix is to upgrade them to the latest safe re the release. Um, that may be great from a vulnerability perspective, but it may introduce other issues for you. So um, it's great to game play, you know, play these out, kind of um, war game these out. What happens if we upgrade this? Or let's try, let's upgrade something and see what the impacts are. There may be a license change that may be incompatible for you. Um, there may be a API incompatibility or memory bloat or unwanted features, et cetera. So it's important to understand these fixes may fix your vulnerability problem, but they might cause architectural licensing problems for you. There may be some other things that you can do beyond upgrading it, maybe um, turning off features or putting in firewall rules or shims or things like that that can buy you some time. But the important thing is to have a plan and this is where if you're not already talking to your CISO and your security team and your engineering team and your legal team, it's important to understand that um, you're probably sitting on vulnerabilities right now that need to be addressed and fixed. And it's best to start. Um, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just start, start working on it and start chipping away at the attack surface. Um, where this comes up very often is customers are starting to ask. Customers are running their own scanners, uh, whether it's like a dynamic scanner called DAST style scanners, 
or SCA, which is software composition analysis, which are open source um, component scanners. We're seeing more and more uh, kind of customers saying, hey, I ran your product through our, our DAST scanner or SCA scanner, and here's a laundry list of problems that you gave us. Um, they might have human teams, you know, especially if you're selling to large, very large, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies. They might say, well, it's great, we'll install this, but only after we do put it, pass it through our security team or human team review. And they expect you to fix the most egregious issues at least. Um, they're going to want open source disclosures as part of your contract very often. We're seeing this more and more. Um, give us a list of all the open source you're using. And uh, hey, this is an up, this is, this report's five years old. What are you, what are you doing here? You know, it has to be updated, et cetera, et cetera. And red flags will make them walk away. Um, I've seen security issues and lack of software visibility make big companies walk away. They have probably multiple choices of vendors that they could be using. And the ones who have poor security are often ones that are, that are passed over when it comes to uh, um, getting the contract. Okay, so that brings us to remediation, which is a fancy word meaning fix. Uh, and so you'll, you'll often ask, well, you know, what's our remediation strategy? Uh, how do we fix these things? And, and I think it's, 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 there's two sides of the coin here. One is, it is much easier to build in open source management in new products that you're building. So if you're starting a new project today, you should be having code scanning installed from the very beginning. You should have license policy clear. You should be having a, a great CVE upgrade policy. Um, start, do it right the first time. But fixing an existing product is sometimes difficult, sometimes expensive, but so is doing nothing. Um, just waiting around and waiting for an attack or waiting for a customer problem um, makes it so that you're working on somebody else's time, time you know, calendar than, rather than yours. So um, you'll find that legal concerns sometimes get in the way of technical analysis. Like, oh, don't go look there because we don't wanna know. We don't wanna know what's going on there. Um, I personally think that um, that sometimes blocks important security work. I, I think you need to get past the, oh, don't look there when we might find something. Well, you will find something and you'll be on somebody else's time, you know, time um, schedule to fix it. The oddball licenses definitely lead to large legal bills. Um, the weirder they are, the sometimes the, the harder it is for people to understand or, or figure out. Um, GPL violations can be very, very expensive to fix. Um, so again, try to get those fixed sooner rather than later. But also commercial violations, where we always talk about open source, but some of the biggest bills that I've seen have been commercial violations where somebody has shipped, you know, thousands or millions of copies of a commercial library and then the accounting comes due and the bill is big. So um, sooner you can fix these things, the cheaper it will be. And it is always better to fix these things before they go out the door the first time. And nobody ever has to respect your own timetable. You know, your, your customer can say, you need to fix this in a week or we're going to another vendor. Um, you don't have a lot of control over that discussion. It's good to, it's good to um, respond and it is good to um, take it very seriously. The companies that ignore, put their head in the sand around vulnerability disclosure or license disclosure um, very often get routed around and not, not picked in the future. So let's talk about some best practices. How do, we, how do we work with our suppliers? Well, first off, you wanna select vendors who can provide you what's called that current bill of materials. So if you have a choice of two vendors and you say, tell us what open source you're using and one vendor you know, that same day sends you a bill of materials and the other one says, what do you mean bill of materials? Um, that's a good sign. You know, having a current bill of materials is a really good sign of good engineering practices, good security practices and good compliance practices. Um, there's a project called Open Chain which is a um, ISO standard for managing supply chain and open source dependencies. If somebody is open chain certified or conformant, that's a really good sign. Um, um, there's still a lot of work to be done there and there's still a lot of companies who, who need to, to kind of bring that up, up and running, but it's a really good sign if you see that. Um, you may see service level agreements for security fixes and alerts. That's a really good sign to see. Um, and, and if you're buying software, you may want to put that in place yourself. Um, I'm seeing more and more of these things becoming required contract terms, you know, you will supply the list of bullet materials, um, you will fix, uh, you know, red issues or orange issues within a certain amount of time. And you do your validation test, you know, run, um, you know, if you're getting code from third parties, run it through an SCA tool or run it through a dynamic scanning tool, see what comes up. And if you see problems, before you sign a contract, the best, you have the most power right then to say, hey, I, I want to use your stuff, but I see these problems. Um, that's sometimes a great way for them to get some pressure to kick off their engineering fixes themselves. Say, hey, my, my customers are asking for it. it. Makes it a little more palatable internal to, internally to get these things running. But the buck does stop with you. If you are a product, if you're a product company and you are 
your supply chain gives you a problem, you can point the finger and say, oh, it's, it's not our fault. It's, you know, we inherited bad code from XYZ. But I think in general, your customers look at you to say, well, I don't care why the problem occurred. I'm just upset that a um, problem occurred on your watch. So do you remember the buck stops with you. It is, it is important for you to respect, you know, your, your customer data and your customer needs. So how do you become compliant? You know, you've gone to this session, you've listened to this, you know, how, what, what more do we have to do? Well, I think, I think first off is build your team of internal open source experts internally. That could be one person, two people, eight people, 10 people. Um, I see more and more uh, people are making what's called open source working groups. That's kind of a quasi official dotted line. You know, it's not, it may not be somebody's um, direct reports, but it's people who enjoy open source, understand licensing, understand security, or at least have a, um, a, a concern in that space. Um, make sure your projects all create a bill of materials, also known as a BOM or a software bill of materials, SBOM. We're seeing more and more requirements. And I think we're gonna see from, at least in the US, more federal requirements about mill materials for um, uh, companies working with the government. Um, there is SPDX reports. That's a format for sharing open source notices and disclosures. Uh, be able to make that. You wanna look for a tool that can generate that or an equivalent. Obviously do the education. Um, I think you can't, you can't educate your staff enough. There's some great courses like the Linux Foundation has a, a IP and licensing course. It's like an hour, it's free. Um, great beginning start for that. I think nobody is too senior to get this. I think sometimes the senior people probably need it more than the junior people. Um, and if you can yourself become open chain conformant, they make it very easy. You go to the open chain project to see the checklists and the things that you need to do. Um, in terms of licensing and education, um, software developers often lack training. We don't teach this in university. Uh, people people self-select to come to talks like this, but it's usually not mandated. And it's important to, to make sure that your developers get this. I, I personally think it should be mandated training. I think the most important thing that we can do around software development these days is have open source understanding by, the, by our developers. Um, Open source policies need to be created. They're, they're impossible to find. You know, if you're your, your company right now and said, "What? Let me find our open source policy." If it's not on a website, if it's not on an internal um, share, um, you should push for that. It should be crystal clear what your license policies, what you can use and can't use, and who, where do you go for help should be crystal clear. Um, legal could be scared to look for problems. I think it's sometimes important to rip that bandaid off and say, "Let's start. Let's start looking. Let's start chipping away." Because we we want to make we want to build all new products in a compliant way, and we want to go back and we want to try to make sure our, our existing products are compliant and secure. And the cost of fix every 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 time you add a new layer, it becomes much more expensive to fix things. So try to fix these things just like any bug sooner rather than later. And if you if you discover these problems at sales time, um, this becomes a red alert. You know your company your customer runs a scanner against this and finds an open source license problem or a security problem. Um, guess what? That just, just destroyed your engineering roadmap for the quarter because you're going to make the big sale. You're going to have to um, push out your, your, your release and fix, you know, fix the license problem or fix the security problem and deals die over this. So it's important to um, understand this and game, game it out to understand what your team needs to do in order to respond to these things. Um, there's no excuse to not have everybody have basic training. I put a link here um, for some great open source training. OpenChain also has some great free training that's out there that's self-serve. And I do think there's no excuse. Though um, it is sometimes important for the internal, there to be kind of the train the trainer person inside um, that is sometimes kind of that, that the, the, the crystal that everything crystallizes around. So in terms of remediation strategies, um, again, you don't want to um, <laughs> let this go to the end in order to fix these things. Um, you know, you have a couple ways of fixing things. You have the re rewind, replace, or resolve. So rewind means you remove the feature. You know, you had into, you know, oh, we want to generate PDFs, but oh, we picked the wrong PDF library and um, it's causing us a, a licensing problem. Well, remove the print PDF feature. Um, customers might be upset, but you no longer have that IP problem, no longer have that license or vulnerability problem. Um, it's, it's kind of doing surgery with an ax. It's not very, uh, not very, uh, not a lot of finesse there, but sometimes it's a way to very quickly uh, resolve a problem. Um, you can replace it. That's very common. You know, you say, oh, well, we're never going to be able to comply with this license or it's too expensive to pay for. So let's go find an alternative or let's go rewrite it in a somewhat clean room if you can. 
or you resolve it. So maybe you can um, purchase a commercial license to get rid of the uh, licensing problem you found. Maybe you can re request new licensing. Sometimes the open source um, person picked a certain license, not because they had a particular philosophy in mind, but they just didn't know any other open source licenses. You can sometimes request a license that's better for your model. You know, maybe less copy left, maybe more copy left, depending on what you need. Um, you'll sometimes hear developers say, oh, we'll just make a shim. Oh, we're going to write around this. Oh, yeah, I know we have a GPL problem, but we're going to make a shim. Um, I typically, if I hear, start hearing people talking about, you know, shimming around or putting a firewall between the commercial and GPL code, it definitely can work. It definitely happen. But I think it's important to get your legal team involved and your architecture team involved and understand, you know, are you really fixing the problem? Are you just causing, you know, bad feeling in the open source world? You know, do the right thing. You know, you might be able to architecture your way around it, but um, sometimes that's a sign that people are um, just doing a lot of work, but they're not really going to fix the licensing issue there. Um, a lot of this comes up in, OS, uh, in mergers and acquisitions. So if you are buying a company or selling a company, it's extremely common for you to do open source due diligence. Um, very often with a third party expert, you bring in a company who is at arm's length takes a look at the source code, takes a look at the binaries and generates a report. You know, the, the sell side is gonna give a bunch of disclosures of the open source and commercial code they depend on. Um, they'll provide the source code to a third party. And then the buy side is gonna look, they'll, they won't get access to the source code, but they'll get, often they'll get a list of the bill of materials and the problems. And the buy side might come to you and say, here's what we need you to fix. Or they might, they might hold back some money or make the deal worth a little less because of intellectual property or security risk. Typically, you need about two weeks to get that first report and then maybe a few more weeks for remediation. Um, if you think you can do this in a day or two, that's not going to work. You know, build a couple weeks into your project. And it's really, if you're thinking about selling your company, I think it's really important to, to start cleaning up things sooner rather than later. It looks a lot better um, for you. And again, do it on your timetable as opposed to the M&A timetable if you can. Um, on the other side, you might be releasing something on a, on the, under an open source license. And we had a question about this in the first, um, kind of the first uh, part of the session today. Um, pick a license that fit, works with your use case. Some people like very short and sweet, very permissive licenses like the MIT. You know, short code, short, small project, small license sometimes. Um, here's my little JavaScript library and it's under an MIT license. Other people are working in an environment where they're maybe they're working in the Linux community where the expectation is a GPL license. So figure out what community you're in, figure out what's the best use case for your license. Um, if you are using open source, perhaps as a business model driver, maybe you pick a very uh, strong viral license because you want to sell commercial commercial terms to other people. Again, that's that's, these are the things that you want to do sooner rather than later, understand what you're, you know, why are you dealing with open source? Why are you dealing with licensing? You, you want to clean up your code before you release it. So you might have commercial code in there. You're not allowed to ship. You don't have the rights to sell or ship. Um, any images, sounds, fonts, pictures, icons, they probably have licensing, almost certainly have licensing associated with them. Developers are really bad about grabbing video and audio and fonts. Um, under and not paying attention to the licensing. It's something to figure out before you ship something. Um, review your open source usage and compliance with your selected license. Um, if you're releasing something as open source, I do think it's important to do a deep dive with source code snippet scanning. Um, you wanna figure out where the, the cut and pastes are coming from. And um, especially if, you're, if your library is um, you know, taking code from a, a you know, a a brother or sister library, you want to make sure that you're you're not doing anything wrong around licensing. Um, sometimes you have to fix your license, change your license. I've seen a lot of projects where they said, oh, we want to come out as an Apache 2.0 license. And then they find that they have such a dependency on general public license code, and there's no easy way to remediate it. So they change their license to GPL2 as well. So you might be able to fix things or change things, but sometimes you, you just change your view of what your licensing should be. And that, that's fine. Um, generate your license notices like we saw in the Chrome example. And then you might decide that it's important for you to have things like a contributor licensing agreement or a developer certificate of origin, a code of conduct. These are all things that are really important for to, to build an open source community or at least have your community understand what the obligations and expectations as community members are. And if you're, especially if you're expecting commercial contributions from companies, you may need to see these things as well um, for, for your project. So um, each of those is worth its own session. 
but um, things to look at and, and understand that they might be something that you need to decide upon. Um, I think if you're trying to manage open source at a company right now, I'm a big believer of automated scanning. I, in my previous life, I started a, a scanning company. I think the, the amount of open source dependencies that people are depending on right now are beyond humans' ability to discover and manage. It's just not fair to humans to make them manage hundreds or thousands of items. Um, you can manage 50 components maybe in a spreadsheet. Maybe a team of us can maybe do 500 on a spreadsheet, but nobody can manage thousands and thousands. And you don't get the security alerts out of a spreadsheet. So I think it's important. There's some great um, open source tools that are out there. There's some great commercial tools that are out there. You may already have some of these tools in place if you're using things like Maven or NPM. There's some um, built-in features and functionality that you can get a kickstart of um, kind of the open source license management and vulnerability management. And um, you know these tools make it should make it easy to have your policy put in software, have your ability to create bill of materials automatically just by hitting a button. And the, one of the most important things I think is the security alerts or license alerts, especially if you're doing a CI CD uh, process. You want to find the problems as soon as they're introduced and resolve them um, before you ship them or get a, a big community based on around them. So very quickly, here's a list. There's, there's I would say, probably a couple dozen um, SCA, um, basically open source code scanner tools that are out there right now. Some built into the repositories, some built into the code hosting, and others are commercial software that you can download or, or purchase. Um, I think you can't go wrong with any of these right now. They are better than doing um, nothing. Um, the thing to be aware of when you do bring in open source scanning is what are they looking for? Very often the free tools and even the commercial tools just stop at this first level, the repository artifacts, things like finding your large compiled um, libraries like jars or um, the node modules and things like that. And that's great. That's probably where vast majority of your open source is probably coming in for in terms of uh, the number of libraries you're bringing in. So you, you need to manage repository artifacts. There's probably the first great place to start. Um, it's pretty non-controversial. If it says you're using project A, you probably are using project A. Um, it's not complete though, especially if you're dealing with like the IoT or Linux or automotive space, you're gonna need to look at things that are coming in beyond the repositories. Uh, for license text, copyrights, um, stolen files, stolen libraries, things like that. Um, that might be signs of compliance problems or commercial problems, things like that, but all the way down to cut and pastes in the source code fingerprint world. So keep that in mind, um, but I think you want to on-ramp with at least the repo artifacts sooner rather than later. Um, the source code snippets are important for finding things like um, uh, deep GPL violations where people grabbed code from a library under a copyleft license and bringing it into a commercial project. Um, it's a lot of work, a lot of false positives, but I think it's important, especially if you are um, in certain parts of the ecosystem, whether you're building open source projects yourselves or dealing very closely with Linux technology or IoT technology. Um, I'm gonna skip over the SAST and DAS tools for in the interest of time, but basically these are ways of finding new vulnerabilities, whether it's in your source code or in your running system. I think they're very important to run, I think especially with the emphasis on software security these days. And the reason why it's important is your, um, your customers are often going to mandate that you need to run SAST and DAS tools as part of the commercial contracts that you're signing. Um, you may find that they are also mandating, they might not say you need to run an SCA tool, but they're gonna mandate that you need to have a bill of materials. So SAS, DAS, and SCA are all tools that you may find yourself in your engineering tide running. Um, you can get, again, many of these are free, many of these are commercial. It really depends on um, getting that on-ramp, but I think it's important to start that on-ramp and build that knowledge in-house of how to run these tools and how to respond to events that come out of these tools. Okay. Um, one real quick uh, call out again for OpenChain. I think OpenChain is a great project. They make it very easy to understand what the expectations around open source management is. They have a great set of resources around training and documentation. And you're seeing more and more companies um, becoming conformant, especially now that it's a ISO standard. Um, and you can self-certify. You don't need to bring somebody else in to certify you, though you can if you want. You can have somebody, um, you can pay to have somebody get you up to speed on it. So last thing here, I'll just say a, kind of a list of best practices. 
Um, I am a huge believer of using technology to build your bomb. I actually think it's, um, I used to say start with education. I am coming around to the start with scanning. Um, training can take a long time. You wanna get that in place. But I think if you are starting someplace and you wanna make an impact right away, run a tool, find some problems, start fixing them, and then build your education and your policy plan around what you're finding. Generate those notice reports and notices. Don't make somebody have to deal with them in spreadsheets. It's the 21st century. Um, keep track of your source code, especially keep track of your commercial libraries and dependencies, keep track of payments and EULAs. Anytime somebody clicks, I agree, I agree, that should be saved someplace because you signed up to do something legal. Track web services. I think it's a very overlooked part of the world here is more and more APIs are being consumed as web services. Uh, those might not be open source, but they're dependencies. And the dependencies might be commercial, they might be um, have a, a EULA or a service level agreement, and it may be something that gets cut off in production. You know, if you're in testing, you do five hits a day, maybe no problem. But if you go if you if you go public and suddenly it's five million hits on that web service a day, that person on the other end of that API might shut you down. So it's important to know what your dependencies on web services are and what the um, expectations for service level agreements and whatnot. Track your open source source files, mark them appropriately, never ever uh, clip or cut away license text or copyright text. Um, if you're dealing with codecs, uh, audio, video, things like that, check out for patent issues and patent licensing. Do look at your CVEs and your vulnerability reports. Um, go download the OWASP um, dependency check tool. It's free, it's easy to run. You, your eyes will be very open um, once you run that. Great on ramp. All you know, even if you're going to pick a commercial tool, um, great way to understand what's there um, as well. If you can run SAST and DAST, or at least start to build that knowledge in house, and then keep doing this. It's it's one thing to do it once and then let that age out two years, three years, four years. Um, I think the time to be able to do that is long past. I think this is something that needs to just be part of your sprint planning and your policies internally. So. Things I learned along the way before we go to questions, compliance is still very personality driven. Very often you have only one or two people max at a company, no matter how big you are, who really care about this or know about this. And when they leave, the, the policies and processes often fall apart. Our job is to make sure that there's more than just one or two people in a company that understands this. Experience levels are definitely very, very greatly. You might talk to somebody and they are the most knowledge about open source in the world. Somebody at a different company of the same title don't know anything about licensing, et cetera. Um, understand that. Um, the bomb inventory, just because somebody produces a bill of materials, I never trust them. They're very often undercounting the true dependencies. It depends on what tool and what person and also kind of how, how open the company wants to be. Um, you can sometimes find 10 libraries or a thousand libraries for that same scan, depending on the vendor you pick or the person that runs it. So understand that, that you might not be getting the full picture. And analysis paralysis. It's very easy to not make a decision because you're scared about choices. My philosophy is start making choices, start start understanding, start fixing things. Um, and it's an art, not a science. You know, you're going to learn along the way. Nobody, nobody um, is ready to start wholly, wholly born today. You learn by doing and uh, start doing. So with that, I'm going to um, move to Q&A because we're finding ourselves at the end of the time here. And, um, and like I said, if you have any questions, follow up on Twitter or through my website um, if we don't get a chance to answer your question today. So I want to thank you again for your time. And let's see if there's any Q&A. OK. Um, somebody um, asked if it would be possible to get a recording of the session. Yes, there will be recordings of these sessions. Um, both uh, the morning session and this evening session um, be posted. Usually it takes uh, maybe one or two weeks for them to get up there. I believe they'll be posted. Okay. Um, someone, Addy asks, what about the Open Source Security Foundation? Any thoughts? Um, I think this is, this is the um, um, Open SSF. Uh, this is a new organization that I think is doing some really great work. I think these are, um, it's an important project to follow. Uh, it's important because it's really looking at the core infrastructure that is causing, um, you know, it's, it's not that they're causing problems, it's just that the, the, the core infrastructure that often is targeted by people who want to break into your company or causing um, security problems. So I think they are a great project to watch. I, I follow their stuff on Twitter. 
I think if you are at a big Fortune 50 company or IoT or automotive, it's very important for you to be aware of the Open, open Source Security Foundation and especially the alerts that are coming out from them. They are, I, I think they're well informed and they know what they're doing. And if they're saying something's a problem, I'm going to jump when I see that it's a problem. So thanks. Um, um, Grant asks, as someone super new to this entire field, I had no I, I, idea about this side. I'm very glad. Um, okay, so that's a comment. So just uh, um, thank you, Grant. I appreciate the, the feedback there. And let's see. Okay, I believe I've got everything in the chat. And let me see if there's anything on the Q&A side here. And I believe we don't have any open Q&A. So we're at 1.30 now. I really appreciate everybody um, coming to the talk today. If you have any questions whatsoever, please follow up um, Jeff Lush um, at Twitter. And I uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you next time and really appreciate any questions or comments or feedback on the topics today. I always like to make this, uh, this better for folks. So I welcome all the responses. Thanks. <laughs>